Well, hello. Today in this lecture, we'll be learning about adaptive immunity, also known as acquired immunity. And the topic specifically that we'll be discussing will be antigens and lymphocytes, immune cells of the immune system. These are the B cells and the T cells specifically. As we talk about B cells, we'll talk about their most important secretion or component. Those are antibodies. And we'll spend the remainder of our lecture talking about T cells specifically. Incidentally, what we see here, this beautiful ribbon diagram, is an IgG, an immunoglobulin, more commonly known as an antibody. And we're going to see that antibodies play a huge role in the adaptive immunity response. So adaptive immunity is really all about adaptive defenses. This is our built-in specific defense system, and it's that specificity that really distinguishes adaptive immunity from innate immunity. The adaptive response can eliminate almost any type of invading pathogen, and again, it does it specifically. So here I like the analogy of homing a missile onto a foreign invader. That missile's not dropped blindly. That missile's not thrown out of the plane without any guidance. Instead, it is locked onto a specific enemy target, and that missile finds its way to that target to destroy it. This is exactly how the adaptive immunity response works. The pathogens that are causing disease and sickness are identified specifically and attacked specifically uh, so that everything else around it can be ignored. That's different from the innate system. You've learned about the innate system already, but the innate system is always ready to react. It's always on guard. The adaptive system instead has to be primed. It needs a first exposure to the enemy so it knows how to recognize it. So that priming comes from exposure to the pathogen itself. Once that exposure occurs and the system is primed, it remains ever vigilant. That implies that the adaptive immunity system has memory, and it does. It responds much more quickly to that same pathogen if a future exposure occurs, even years and years later. That means the adaptive immunity system is protective. Once we've been exposed to a pathogen once, we're essentially immune to it, at least for a number of years after that first exposure. And this is why the adaptive immunity response also goes by the name as acquired immunity. It's immunity that you can achieve with exposure, different from innate immunity. So the three main hallmark features of adaptive immunity are that it is specific. We've touched on that a number of times. It can specifically recognize a single foreign invader. It is systemic. It protects almost the entire body with the exclusion of just a few systems. And it has this protective memory so that future exposure to the same pathogen can be dealt with extremely quickly before sickness or disease even occurs. And all of this, the systemic nature of adaptive immunity, its specificity and its memory, all of it's possible because of these beautiful molecules that we call antibodies. And these antibodies, they circulate in the blood way back when the blood was called the humerus or the humeral fluids. And so the antibody-based immune system is often referred to as humeral immunity because it does exist in the blood. The antibodies are in the blood. So let's talk about this priming. How do we kick off this response? Well, in a nutshell, this system is primed through exposure to antigens. Anything that can cause an adaptive immunity response is an antigen. And antigens are bound by antibodies. Antigens are things that antibodies can bind to. Now, to be clear, a single complex antigen couldn't be bound by many different antibodies. And the word is actually a conjunction of antibody generating. So antigens cause antibodies to be made, and those antibodies will bind directly to the antigen. This means that by definition, immune response causing antigens are non-self. They do not come from our own bodies. They are foreign. And they have two distinct properties. First, they're immunogenic. That means that antigens can stimulate an immune system response and more specifically stimulate immune cells to divide and multiply very rapidly. Second, antigens are reactive. This means that antigens react with antibodies directly. Antibodies bind to them and the immune system cells as well to result in an immune response. So antigens stimulate the immune system to cause immune cells to grow and divide rapidly, and they react specifically with antibodies and immune system cells, generating an immune response. All of that is because of this property of antigen-antibody binding. 
antigens bind specifically to antibodies, and we'll touch on that again in just a moment. Proteins tend to be the most potent antigens. They can elicit the most severe immune response, and the larger the protein, the more complex the protein structure, the more of a response it can generate. So what's reacting to these antigens? What are these immune system cells that we keep speaking about? There are actually three critical cell types involved in the adaptive immunity response. The first are B cells. These are the cells that are responsible for making the antibodies that circulate in the blood. We also have T cells. T cells have three main functions depending on their type. They help B cells initiate their response. T cells can also be killing cells. They can kill pathogenic cells, and they can also regulate and suppress the immune response. Sometimes we want the immune response to be toned down, to be attenuated, and T cells can do that for us. The third cell type needed for adaptive immunity are called APCs. These are antigen-presenting cells. It's difficult for our immune system to respond to free antigens that are just present in our bodies. Instead, we need filter cells that will take these antigens in, process them, and then show them or present them to B cells and T cells and say, hey guys, these are the things that you need to be looking for and attacking. It is the antigen presenting cells that do that processing of antigens and then present them to B cells and T cells for activation. All B cells originate in bone marrow, red bone marrow specifically, this is called their origin, and they mature in bone marrow as well. In fact, we can think of the B in B cells as standing for bone, where these cells mature. Once they mature, they should acquire two main properties. First, they need to be immunocompetent. This means they need to be able to recognize an antigen by binding directly to it. The B cell has to have the ability to bind to an antigen. That makes it immunocompetent. Second, it needs to be self-tolerant. The B cell should not be able to recognize self-antigens, our own proteins, as foreign. If B cells recognize our own cells as foreign, they will launch an immune response against our own self-cells. That would be an autoimmune disease. We can't have that. So in order for a B cell to mature properly, it needs to be able to recognize an antigen by binding to it and be able to ignore self-antigens. Those are the ideas of immunocompetence and self-tolerance. So what else goes into maturation, maturation of these lymphocytes? Well, for both B cells and T cells, they require two to three days to fully mature. Again, as I told you, B cells mature in the bone marrow, B for bone. T cells actually mature in the thymus. They're born in red bone marrow, but they migrate to and develop in the thymus. So T is for thymus. Bone marrow and the thymus are referred to as primary lymphoid organs because this is where our lymphocytes, our immune system cells, mature. For T cells, there are two tests that, very much like B cells, ensure immunocompetence and self-tolerance. The first test is called positive selection. Can the T cell bind to a presented antigen if that antigen is shown to the T cell by an APC? If it can't do that, it's really not much use of us at all. And so the T cell dies through a process called apoptosis, a cell-invoked suicide. If the T cell can bind to an antigen that is presented to it, it passes this positive selection test and survives. This is the idea of immunocompetence. The second test is called negative selection. Can the T cell bind to a presented antigen if that antigen is self and comes from the individual? If the answer to that is yes, that's bad. That means that this T cell could launch an autoimmune response. And so the negative selection failure there is again apoptosis. If the T cell cannot bind to a self antigen, that means it will not attack ourselves, then it passes. And this is the test for self-competence, just self-tolerance, just as we saw in the B-cell maturation story. Believe it or not, only 2% of all born T-cells survives both of these tests, the positive and the negative selection. 98% of T-cells fail one of these tests at least and dies by apoptosis. That's incredible. That's an enormous amount of waste, but it's necessary. Because the only T cells that we can have in our body are T cells that can find a foreign invader and attack it, 
but not mistake our own proteins as self and attack our cells instead. So we need this wasteful process to ensure that our immune system cells are doing the job they're intended to do. We know quite a bit about T cell maturation. The B cell maturation story is a little bit less uh, understood, and so we don't know as much about it. What we do know about B cells, though, is how they activate and differentiate. A naive B cell that has never seen an antigen before becomes activated when an antigen binds directly to it. There are surface proteins on the B cell that can bind to antigens directly, and we'll see those surface proteins are actually a type of antibody. When that B cell becomes activated by an antigen, this launches that humoral immune response that results in antibodies being circulated in the blood. Again, antigens bind to that antibody-like receptor on the B cell surface, and when that binding occurs, it triggers the B cell to divide rapidly, and these newly born B cells that are born by the rapid division of this activated cell are called effector cells. The vast majority of these effector cells become plasma cells, called plasma cells because they work in the blood. And these are the antibody secreting B cells. They actually secrete antibodies at a rate of 2,000 proteins per second per second. That's an incredible amount of protein production and an incredible amount of antibodies being dumped into the blood. Here in this figure, we see that the antibody on the surface of the B cell binds to an antigen, triggering that proliferation, triggering that rapid cell division. Most of those B cells become these plasma cells, and they secrete antibodies. A small subset of the effector cells become memory cells. These memory cells are long-lived, and they remain circulating in the blood for almost as long as the individual stays alive. This is the acquired immunity component of adaptive immunity. This is what conveys the protection of acquired immunity. These memory cells will recognize a foreign invader much more quickly and launch a near-immediate humoral response the next time that pathogen is found in the body. Again, this is why adaptive immunity also goes by the name acquired immunity, because the initial exposure allows the individual to acquire immunity or acquire the ability to fight that infection much more quickly than the next time it is seen in the body. So everything we've just described is a primary immune response. It's the result of the initial exposure to the pathogen. This takes three to six days to launch, and this is why we get sick. So if you think about the normal progression of any run-of-the-mill typical illness, we catch it, we start to feel pretty crummy. Uh, after about three to six days, we begin to feel better, and then we get well again. It's the lag of B cell activation that is allowing us to get sick, and then it is the production of effector cells, differentiation into plasma cells, and the circulation of antibodies that ultimately leads to our recovery, but it takes about a week to get there. So if we chart this, we see that if we expose an individual or a mouse to a pathogen on day zero, we don't even see antibody production until three to five days after that exposure. This is when we're getting ill. Antibodies then take another two to three days to peak, and right around day eight or nine, we have peak antibody response, that primary immune response, and those antibodies are eventually going to make us well. That peak again occurs between 9 and 10 days after B cell activation. If we then look at re-exposure to the same path pathogen, that activation occurs in hours now, not in days. So here on the 28th day, we've re-exposed the individual to the same exact pathogen they were sick with uh, four weeks ago. And within hours, we see a rapid increase in antibody production, and it spikes within hours. It also spikes at a much, much higher level than we ever saw in the first response. By two days post-infection, we're at our highest peak levels of antibodies, and this is our secondary immune response. Because the immune response here was so quick, we don't even get sick. We don't have this many-day lag between exposure and response, and so we never feel the consequences of that pathogen at all. We're immune to it. Again, this is all due to that sub-pool of effector cells, the memory B cells, that remain circulating in our bloodstream, ready to respond to this pathogen again. They're the ones that provide the immunity 
and live in our blood for years, if not for our entire lives. So let's think about what we're really saying here. What we're really saying is that the immune system, when it's naive to a pathogen, takes a long time to quote unquote see it. But once that pathogen has been exposed to the immune system, it doesn't take nearly as long for the immune system to see it again and respond to it. I like to use the analogy of this optical illusion. For those of you that haven't seen this before, this optical illusion is called the two ladies. There are two women's faces shown here. Here's the hat for each of them. The first woman is a young lady. We see her in profile. Here's her eye. Here's her nose. We see just the hint of her lips here. Looks like she's wearing a necklace. And this is her ear and her hair is flowing over her shoulder. The second woman is an older woman. We see her uh, in a much more detailed profile. Again, her hat. This is a bump on her large nose, which terminates here, and here's her nostril. This is her eye, this is her mouth, and this is her chin. Most of you probably saw one of these two faces when I first showed the image, but didn't really see the other until I pointed it out. This is like your first primary immune response. The immune system was naive to the pathogen, and it took a while for the immune system to see and respond to that pathogen. But upon the second exposure, look how quickly your eyes see both of those female faces. This is the secondary immune response, where the immune system is working much, much more fast and counteracting the effects of that pathogen so quickly that you never get sick from it. So let's talk a bit about antibodies. They seem so important to this response. How do they work? Well, antibodies, again, are more formally called immunoglobulins, or IgGs. This is what an antibody looks like. They're beautiful molecules. They are secreted by activated B cells, but they can also be membrane-bound by B cells, and they bind to antigens with specificity. So only one antibody can bind to one type of antigen specifically. They're made up of four different protein chains, called the heavy chains and the light chains. Here's one heavy chain. And here's another. Here's one light chain, and here's another. And they come together to form this truly Y-shaped molecule. Most people mistakenly think that antigens bind to the crux of the Y here. That's not true. The antigens bind to the tips of the Y. So each antibody has two antigen binding sites, one here and one here. And we call this top portion of the antibody the variable region. The stem of the Y down here is called the constant region, and that region is the same in all antibodies of the same class. So the constant region only differs when we're dealing with antibodies of different classes. Because the variable region binds to antigens specifically, the variable region is very unique to each individual antigen antibody so that it can bind antigens directly. So what are these classes of antibodies? Well, to remember the classes, we can use the acronym MADG because we have IgMs, IgAs, IgDs, IgGs, and IgEs. IgMs are the first antibodies to be secreted by B plasma cells during the very, very early stages of the primary response. They bind to pathogenic cells specifically and bring them together or agglutinate them. We'll talk about that in a moment. And also, IgMs can launch and uh, activate the complement response, which you have learned about in your innate immunity material. IgAs are usually dimers. There are usually two IgAs linked together. And these are found in bodily secretions, such as saliva, sweat, even our digestive fluids. And interestingly, in milk, mothers can pass IgAs to their newborn babies through breast milk, providing a, in a kind of acquired and transferred immunity from mother to baby. So if the mother has antibodies in her bloodstream, because she's fighting an infection, she can pass that immunity on to her child, which is uh, incredible, which is interesting. The IgEs tend to be the patrolmen of our epithelial cells. Uh, they are lining our uh, skin and our digestive system, keeping us safe from bacteria and organisms that can penetrate through those barriers. IgDs are the antibody class that are the receptors on the B cells that allow B cells to bind directly to antigens. IgEs are our allergic response antibodies. 
If any of you have allergies, my daughter has a severe peanut allergy. That's due to uh, too many improperly made IgE circulating in the bloodstream. They trigger histamine release and other um, activities that cause allergy responses. The IgGs are the most common class of antibodies. These are the ones that the plasma cells are secreting. These are the antibodies that circulate in our bloodstream. They make up the bulk of the antibodies produced by our cells. These are the antibodies that make us better after infection. So what do these antibodies do? How do they work? Well, antibodies cannot directly destroy pathogens. They can only bind to them, but they can, through that binding, cause the destruction of the pathogens. And they do this through four different mechanisms. Neutralization, agglutination, precipitation, and somewhat separately, the activation of complement. In neutralization, immunoglobulins or antibodies bind to and directly block sites that are on pathogens critical for their infection. This is typically in viruses, but it can also be in bacteria. There are proteins on the surface of viruses that allow those viruses to enter our cells and launch an infection. Antibodies can bind to these proteins directly and block them. That kind of renders the virus useless, because if the virus can't get into a cell, it can't cause its infection, and that protects us from the illness. Agglutination is when antibodies, most notably IgMs, cause pathogenic cells to be clumped together. Uh, by clumping them together, these cells are rendered inactive and we're protected from infection. Interestingly, it is IgMs and agglutination that is used to do blood typing tests as well. What we see here is that we have some blood. This is what blood should look like in this test. But here in this A-type blood, we see that IgMs are binding to and agglutinating or clumping together these blood cells because these blood cells have this A antigen on them. For people with B-type blood, IgMs that react to those B proteins agglutinate the B blood cells, bringing them together. If you're AB, you have the antigens A and B. IgMs can bring both of them together. And O blood essentially has no proteins on the red blood cell surface at all, and we see no agglutination whatsoever. So when we say we're clumping cells together, we are. We're clumping together A blood cells, B blood cells, AB blood cells, or none of those cells. The reason why an individual who has B blood can only receive B blood is because we can't have IgMs in that donated blood that would clump and agglutinate the host's blood cells that would cause uh, a bad reaction. Precipitation is the third mechanism that we use for antibody function. Here, soluble antigens, molecules, are clumped together and brought out of solution. You can think of this as very similar to agglutination, but agglutination is all about clumping whole cells, whereas precipitation is about uh, clumping or glooping together individual molecules. And finally, complement. Complement is the primary defense against bacterial infection. Multiple antibodies bind to that bacterial cell and trigger complement fixation, which you've learned about before. All four of these processes, neutralization, agglutination, precipitation, and the complement pathway, enhance phagocytosis by macrophages. Complement's the only one that also increases the inflammation response and promotes cell lysis, the pathogenic cell to lyse. None of the other three do that. So again, all three of these processes, including the complement, will enhance phagolytosis, but only complement also enhances inflammation and cell lysis. You can use the acronym PLAN to remember the antibody target and function mechanisms. PLAN stands for precipitation, lysis, to remind you about the complement, and glutination and neutralization. So now let's move on to T cells and cellular immunity. Cellular immunity occurs when cells, rather than antibodies, are defending the body. So there's no circulating proteins here. The T cell response is all about the T cells doing the job themselves. And what job they do is killing the pathogenic cells. They can do that directly, or they can cause the death of pathogenic cells indirectly by triggering the inflammation response and recruiting macrophages. The T cell response, the cellular immunity response, is used to attack our own cells, if our cells are infected by a virus, if they're cancerous, or even sometimes if they're transplanted cells. And these T cells come in two types, 
CD4 and CD8. Those names are based on surface proteins and sugars that they express on their cell surface. What's important here is that when activated into effector cells, T cells that are CD4 can become helper T cells or regulatory T cells, and T cells that are CD8 become the cytotoxic killing T cells. Helper T cells are called that because they actually literally help B cells and other T cells become activated, and they cause those cells to divide. It's the helper T cells that are targeted by HIV infection, and the reason why HIV infections can cause an acquired immune, immunity deficiency, or AIDS, is because without helper T cells, it's that much harder for our bodies to launch an immune response. We get sicker with things much more easily. For B cells, the helper T cell will bind to a B cell that is already bound to an antigen. And when these two are linked together, the T cell will release chemicals called cytokines that cause this B cell to begin dividing, to activate. And once this B cell divides into effector cells, we can have those plasma cells that we've talked about before and our memory cells. Helper T cells also activate CD8s, coaxing them into becoming cytotoxic. This isn't a direct binding. Instead, this has to go through an APC. So the T cell binds to an antigen presenting cell directly and becomes partially activated. A helper T cell binds to that same APC recognizing that an infection is in play, and it will then release cytokines. The cytokines released by the helper T cell will cause the CD8 cell to become cytotoxic. These cytotoxic cells are the only ones that can directly kill other cells. They mainly target, target host cells that are endogenously infected, either with viruses or cancer. And much like natural killer cells, Cytotoxic T cells use perforins and granzymes. Those perforins will cause channels to erupt in the membrane of the host cell. And the granzymes are then pumped through those channels and trigger apoptosis, cause that infected cell to kill itself. Again, this is the same mechanism as you likely learned about for natural killer cells. And here we see this beautiful uh, EM image, this scanning electron micrograph image, of a cytotoxic T cell directly bound to a cancerous cell. And through that binding, it is inserting perforin channels into the cancer cell and releasing these granzymes so that that cancer cell will destroy itself. What makes cytotoxic T cells different from natural killer cells is that cytotoxic T cells are responding directly to antigens that it were presented to it. This is a more specific response, whereas natural killer cells don't use an antigen recognition system first. Again, the third class of T cells are these regulatory T cells. We won't spend much time on them at all. Uh, what's important for regulatory T cells is that they dampen down the immune system, and it's important for suppressing the immune system so that autoimmune responses don't occur. Let's wrap this lecture up now by talking about how these APCs actually present these antigens to the immune system. T cells cannot see free antigens circulating in the blood. They need to have those antigens presented to them. T cells will only recognize processed pieces of antigens that are held out to them by antigen presenting cells. And what the antigen presenting cells use to hold and display those antigens are called MHCs, major histocompatibility complexes. These are just surface proteins on the APCs that hold onto the antigen. We can use this simple analogy here. This gift is the antigen, and the MHC are the hands holding it. These hands are connected to the APC, to the person doing the presenting, but they're merely there, the MHCs are merely there to hold and present the antigen to the T cell. There are two different types of MHCs, two different types of hands, type 1 and type 2. All cells, except for red blood cells, have MHC class 1 proteins on them. And these are for holding self-antigens. This is for saying, hey, I'm infected with a virus, come kill me. Hey, I'm cancerous, come kill me. Or, hey, I'm presenting self-antigens, ignore me, leave me alone, I belong to the body.
So these class 1 MHCs are critical for, again, activating cytotoxic T cells. I'm an infected host cell. You need to destroy me. Or for the self-tolerance negative selection test, this is what self looks like. Leave me alone. Only antigen-presenting cells have class 2 MHCs. These are for holding foreign antigens and showing them to CD4 cells, coaxing them to develop into helper T cells. B cells have class 2 MHCs, macrophages, and dendritic cells. All are APCs for the T cell system. So this table figure from your textbook shows this pretty well. MHC class 1s are displayed by all cells that have a nucleus. That's everything but a red blood cell. Only APCs express class 2. Class 1 are recognized by naive CD8 cells for self-tolerance and for cytotoxic T cells knowing to destroy an infected self cell. These class 2 MHC holding cells are recognized by naive CD4s to differentiate them into helper T cells and helper T cells themselves. Foreign antigens that are on these MHCs are Ex and endogenous from inside the cell for class 1 and exogenous from outside the cell for class 2 and the messages being sent by MHC class 1 is either I belong to self and I have a foreign invader destroy me or I am you and leave me alone whereas all MHC class 2 displays are foreign pathogens and trigger an immune response once activated, T cells enlarge and divide. The number of T cells and their response peaks within a week of antigen exposure, and then those T cells begin to drop off by killing themselves, by triggering apoptosis starting a week after the initial exposure and continuing for almost a month. Just like B cells, though, there is a small pool of T cells that persist in the body as memory cells, increasing the rate and speed of the reaction that can be launched. Table 21.4 from your textbook has a really nice breakdown on the differences between the B-cell response and the T-cell response of the immune system. The B-cell response is in the blood. It secretes antibodies. It targets extracellular pathogens. Cells are born in the bone marrow and divide and mature in the bone marrow. The effector cells are plasma cells that secrete antibodies, and we do have a memory cell system. T-cells are responsible for the cellular immunity system, they do not secrete antibodies. They attack intracellular pathogens specifically. T cells are born in the red bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus. There are three different types of effector cells, cytotoxic T cells, which kill other cells, helper T cells, which help activate B cells, and the regulatory cells, which thwart autoimmune responses. And we do have a memory system for T cells as well. Finally, we can summarize this information with two beautiful resources from your textbook. First, Table 21.8 does a wonderful job of providing a glossary for the most important concepts from this material. It defines B cells in general, plasma B cells, helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, regulatory T cells, what we mean by a memory cell, and how APCs play a role in this. These are all cells, and each of these have a role in acquired immunity. We also have a glossary for different molecules, antigens, immunoglobulins, perforins and granzymes, the complement system, and cytokines. So as you review this material, this Table 21.8 is a wonderful resource for you. But my favorite of all these resources is this figure. This figure from your text summarizes how all of these factors come together to give us immunity. Antigens enter our bodies and they trigger two different responses, the innate defenses, which you've learned about before this lecture, and the adaptive defenses. For the adaptive defenses, if those antigens are intracellular, those intracellular antigens need to be digested and processed by APCs. And those APCs can then activate CD8 T cells, causing them to differentiate into helper T cells, and also activate CD8 T cells, causing them to differentiate into cytotoxic T cells. In both of those systems, we've got memory cells that persist. Cytotoxic T cells go on the prowl, and they initially inhibit any more infection. The helper T cells, however, trigger the differentiation of B cells that have bound to free antigens from this infection, but require help and stimulation 
from these helper T cells to divide. When they divide, some of those effector cells become memory cells, but most become plasma cells, which pump out tons and tons of antibodies before dying. Remember, thousands of antibodies per second. Those antibodies then help inhibit further infection through the plan system, precipitation of small molecules, lysis of cells through complement, agglutination of pathogenic cells through IgMs, and neutralization of invading pathogens by binding to critical surface proteins on them, whether they be viruses or bacteria. All of these cells work together and talk to one another to ultimately inhibit further infection from these pathogens or provide us memory through B cell and T cell memory so that subsequent exposure to the same pathogens don't lead to an illness at all. Those illnesses are thwarted immediately. It's a pretty amazing system. I hope you've learned quite a bit about it. And I've got one more question for you right now to answer.